when it, when it comes to your, your younger years and I mean, it was a different climate when it comes to music, hard rock, and today it's just a different animal, right? But what do you think is kind of the most valuable lesson that you learned through your career, even from from the start when you when you got into starting playing bass as a young young boy, to through the career coming to Hollywood or to LA or US, I should say. Yeah. What is the most valuable lesson you would tell someone today who, who wants to start playing a, an instrument? Um, well, several, several things like be yourself, never give up. Um, be, stay open to different styles as a musician, stay open to different styles, but focus. You know, if you, if you want to make it as a with your with your own band or your as your yourself as an artist, don't spread yourself in ten different directions. It's never going to work. You have to focus. Um, yeah. If somebody wants to be a session guy, yeah, spread yourself in a hundred different directions. Absolutely, but um, but uh, um, I don't think that Los Angeles is a good place for a band or an artist to develop uh it's probably one of the worst places uh at first um, it, but it's a great it could be a great place for a session guy somebody who's looking for work who's willing to work with five or ten or fifteen different bands or yeah that stuff um but you know i i think i learned a lot of lessons you know i learned a lot what not to do you know yeah. you know what 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 contracts to not sign to uh what what gear to use and not use i should say you, you know you, you you learn the hard way unfortunately i think that's um sometimes the not the only way but i think people can give you advice all day long but sometimes you go on your path and you and you try to figure it out you know and uh listen i think one thing big thing is listen to your instincts they're never wrong. Yeah. Don't go against your instincts. Don't go against your guts. Your gut's always right. And that's yeah. one thing that I wish I would have not done. Um, but you can't go back. You can't go back. Right. You, you can't change history, right? But And, yeah. and I mean, t today, I mean, the music business side is ruthless, right? I guess it has always yeah. been in some way or yeah. form. But it was easier yeah. to to make a living in the eighties than it is today, because today, I mean, making records is, is not going to pay your, your bills, right? You have to tour, you have to have some kind of selling yeah. merchandise and all that stuff. So it's a different it, animal today. It's a different animal. And speaking of animal or human, let's like take an athlete and say like, you know, sorry, we're going to cut your legs off, but you still have your arms. It's kind of like, well, you can't sell records, but you can tour, but it's almost like saying, well, well, but that's like a catch 22 because you need a record to tour. Right. And you need to tour to sell the record. There's no, rec there's no record to sell to sell. So now you got to charge $200 for the, for the, for the concert tickets. And people these days can't afford it anymore. You know, it's the times yeah. are tough. So. Yeah. It, I don't know. What to say, man. <laughs> but, but you're right. I mean, it is catch 22. It's a really good way of thinking about it because what are you going to do right <laughs> and like i can't tour on an album i did 2011 i have to have a new album out so well i think it, the it, biggest problem is is people blame the record labels and all that and, and sure i can put a lot of blame on them as well but i think the one root of the problem for musicians and artists is musicians never the only workers or the only uh, um, field that we're we're not controlling our own business like the actors have the their unions and they're controlling their you know everybody else does and a well the welders the bus drivers the, everybody yeah. control their own business you know musicians have no business sense and they get walked all over all the time because they don't put their foot down you know and they go like, oh yeah we just we just, we just spent 12 months making a record and put 48,000 hours into it and $30,000 
and we're just going to release it on Spotify. Yeah. Well, but, but why? Like, it, and so the, what, what I think the artists have to do is just, just refuse to go stream. Just don't do it. Because the yeah. labels obviously aren't, aren't going to care because um, the big the big labels like Sony and Universal own stock in Spotify. And when, once I found that out, then that's when the light bulb went up. It's like, oh, that's why they're not suing them. <laughs> yeah, right. They right. Get away with it. At it so, yeah. The ridiculous of what they pay is it's 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 uh, theft. You know, it's really bad. It's robbery. So it's uh, musicians and artists really have to get together, and really more artists and just need to do what we're doing. We're not we're not doing string. We're like why? The people can steal the music, and then a week later, they're gonna be like, okay, that was cool. What's your next album? And right. then, oh, we made two cents on this one. So let's see if we can buy a tour bus with two cents, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when you break so, it down no. to, to all the hours you spend and the, the, the money you spend to produce something, the, yeah. the hourly wage is just m minimal, right? So when you break yeah. it down and you probably don't want to break it down because then like, why am I doing this? But at the same time you yeah. have, it, it's your, it's your life. It's your passion. You, you can't not do it. <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah. no other profession would, would do it. You know, people talk about artists, painters, how they, they're struggling and they hard for them to make money. Yeah. But they, they put money into paint, put time into making a painting and then they sell it. You know, yeah. they don't give it away. Like, you know, with musicians like, well, it, I don't understand what, what they're thinking like they think oh they're going to go into a business and then give away their product like how does that work i'm i'm, I'm trying to figure that out like what are they thinking like you yeah. know and it's it's okay for legacy all already established artists that were established back when you can sell recorded music they're fine they can sell out tours and they can sell merch they're fine but for an upcoming artist right now it's I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the answer is. Like you, you right. get signed with a label, and, and then and then they they're going to take seventy five percent of the royalties because they put five thousand dollars into your album. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's difficult. And and speaking of coming up playing at gigs, I mean, as an up and coming band or a new band with no kind of famous mem members, you have to pay to play, right? Or, right. or you pay, play for free, or like you mentioned, play for a beer and a sandwich. I mean, how is that even possible? You invest money, you invest time to begin with, to learn yeah. the craft. You invest in equipment, thousands of dollars. Yeah. And then you're gonna get a six pack of beer to play a gig. I mean, it's like a slap in the face or a gut punch, right? And it's not fair. Yeah. It's not fair. And I think both bands and venues or promoters start at the wrong end because i've been doing this a long time and it's the, the venues is like how many people are you guys going to bring in well wait a second are you at are you at did you ask the waitress that how many people she's bringing in she's not bringing in anybody she's serving drinks we're playing music instead of the jukebox you're getting us you know I mean, yeah. it's, it's just it's, they're starting at the wrong end as opposed to them going like, we're going to get a really good band and then we're going to get a good reputation. We're going to bring people to the band. They don't think of it that way. They, they think of it like, we want to make money now. And the bands are just as stupid. They go like, oh, we'll, we'll play for free. It's good exposure to show <laughs> the world that we're, we're freebies. It's terrible exposure. Yeah, how, how do you write, write checks with exposure? I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's the new currency. <laughs> <laughs> <The musicians. laughs> yeah, no, it's really, but I think it's part of, I mean, society today, they just expect everything for free, whatever it comes down to. And yeah, well, streaming services, movies and music, I guess movies are getting paid better for streaming, but, and it's yeah. not like individuals who are releasing movies, obviously, but yeah. there are very few people like, I mean, who listen to an album on Spotify, for example, and then like, oh, I love this album so much. I want to buy the actual physical CD or vinyl. 
I want to buy yeah. the T-shirt. I want to go to the band's website and order merch. Very few people do that today. Yeah. And uh, obviously, it's I not agree. enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, in a way, I don't, I wish more people would support the artist. But at the same time, um, back when you bought a record, you supported the band. You didn't have to buy the T-shirts and go or do all this stuff. You didn't have to go to the concerts. You bought the record. You supported them. They got paid. Now, yeah. um, if you don't buy the T-shirt, the band gets nothing. You know. Yeah. So it's 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 and it's it puts unfair pressure on the fans too because fans, not everybody has has extra money to buy the T-shirt. You know, they they spent the you know they, they bought the concert ticket or or whatever. You know. So yeah. It's a uh, it's a very strange business. I, it, it, funny because I was just watching last night. I was watching a documentary about um, Tower Records, you know, and how oh, yeah. they started and how they. It, it's uh, kind of a um, very happy and sad story at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I watched it too, and I mean, it's a. What a success story to begin with, right? They expanded everywhere, and then, yeah, just overnight, everything just kind of shut down, right? So. Well, I hope that everybody who who watched that film that one thing that they should learn from that is if whoever starts a business is to not expand too quickly. Yeah, you know, don't get it all over your head, and no, no matter what field you're in, it's to make sure you're not barring against yourself you know don't borrow money against yourself and expand if you're super successful and you got millions and millions of dollars to to uh, as a profit open new stores but it sounded like tower records didn't really do that they just kept borrowing money that they didn't really you know too quickly yeah so that, that could be you know <laughs> this, <laughs> end up in, this is a dis disaster really but, and it's common that that happens, right? You have seen these businesses and things just blow up and then all of a sudden was not right. <laughs> like, were, yeah. yeah. And that's but, okay. Sometimes you take a chance and they go like, well, we got to gamble to, to win. And that's, that's understandable in certain yeah. cases. So, yeah. Oh, it's true. true. Well, the time and a place for everything, I guess, you know, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> Once the CD wasn't selling anymore, what are you going to do? You know what I mean? Right. Um, and I mean, now vinyl sells more than CDs, apparently, I heard somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like, I mean, I you and I, I we grew up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we, you know, took our allowance and uh, we bought the vinyls we wanted, whatever it was. Rainbow, Metallic, Iron Maiden, uh, Judas Priest, and, and, and yeah. now... Think about it. All these bands are still around, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> they are. And I don't want to sound like an, an old dinosaur, but I think you got more for your money. But, because back then, it was like the music was more honest. They weren't restricted by the labels in the same way. They all sounded yeah. different. The records were mixed differently. They were recorded differently. Uh, they had great artwork. Um, they were real bands that would tour. And it, it was... Um, you know, more genuine, I think. Yeah. I, I think now is that people are chasing, it's like a cookie cutter model of everybody, you know, have, the drum sounds the same, the guitar sounds the same, everything sounds the same, and it's mixed the same. And it's yeah. very, very boring, um, unfortunately. There's a few really good, unique acts out there, but not a hundred like when i grew up there was a hundred bands that i was just like oh my god they're all amazing you know yeah that's yeah. true <laughs> oh it's it's different and i think it's part of like when when you when a band has a really successful album everybody's looking who who produced it right who mixed it right and they all go after that person and they all want to have them on the album then yeah. like i said they all sound the same right because he or she has her her way of putting this art into their painting, if you will. So, right. Yeah. Well, that, that's true. And, and, and that's a good, funny thing you mentioned that because I was just I, one guy that came to mind is uh, Martin Birch. Yeah. His name is 
produced Maiden, many Maiden records and Deep Purple records too, at the beginning. Um, but he didn't make those bands all sound the same. He pulled the best out of those bands for them to be themselves and bring them, you know, to light, as opposed to doing the cookie cutter method. You know? Yeah. So really different approach. Everything seemed to be a, a different approach back in the day. Um, you, you wanted to have your own song. You, did, you, you didn't want to sound like everybody else. Now it's almost like, I don't know. Like, like you do. Yeah. People, people strive for strange things. It's like, you know, no matter how great a band is, what, what would you want to sound like them? <laughs> no, but that's also, it's a good point because it also, I think from a fan perspective, if there is a band that... Um, all the genre and a, a band that you like. And uh, then you see, okay, this band here was also mixed or produced by this studio or whatever it was. Mm. Then you kind of kind of have, have expectations it's going to sound very similar, right? It's a similar, similar type of music. Then it's easier yeah. to find new bands that you may like. And I, uh, just on top of my head, I'm thinking about, uh, what's his name? Jacob Hansen from, from Denmark. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of bands he releases, it sounds very similar, similar type of uh, mixing he does, which yeah. I'm a big fan of. I love those bands. And the same yeah. thing, remember back in the uh, late 90s, 2000s, Finvox out of Finland, they did Stratovarius and Sonata Arctica mm -hmm. and all these kind of power metal bands. I think yeah. even Nightwish were there. So you kind of knew exactly what you were getting, right? And from a fan perspective, that could be good because if you keep, don't keep track on every single band comes yeah. out, it could be <laughs> easier to find something you like, right? Yeah, oh, and, and, and that's always good. I think like that's okay. Sometimes, you know, you grow up in the same town, you, like the bands that grew up in London, they borrowed each other's instruments and each other's musicians sometimes, you yeah. know, and it, it's all good and, and, and uh, you know, you get the family of the deep purple, white snake, and rainbow, and all the you know inbreed, and uh, if you want to call it that. But you know, or, or you know whether or it's Swedish bands or German bands, they kind of have like the little, and and that's cool. In a to a certain extent, I think it's good. You know, and it's it's charming. But when it becomes like a worldwide cookie cutter thing, then it kind of lost its whole whole uh, originality. Yeah, that no, was true. And, and it's also interesting because some of the bands that, uh, newer bands, or uh, newer for me, at least. So what's, what's the name of the band? Greta, Greta Van Fleet. They, they uh, are young, young men, but they play kind of old 70s style rock, right? And yeah. so a lot of bands are mixing up the, the old way of, of, I guess, recording music and sounding like that. And it, that's cool too, I, I think. It's kind of yeah. full circle, if you will. Yeah, and that's the whole thing with art. It's um, why limit yourself? Some some people like the, the program drums or fake drums or replaced drums. I personally hate it. it I yeah. know it's very <laughs> difficult to get a good snare drum sound, for example. It's very, very, very hard. But I like the real thing. You know, I'm, I... I I really enjoy listening to, you know, that. And, uh, but, but Hey, you know, some people, they don't care. Some fans don't care and that's fine. You know? Um, yeah. I think when you're listening to a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Swedish power metal. And no, it's not Swedish it's Swedish or German, like European power metal, whether it's yeah. Finnish or, or whatever the band might be for. Um, and you got the double kick and all that stuff. Then the fans go like, "Oh, it's fine." You know, the, all the all the drum kits sound the same. You know, all the drummers sound the same. Fine, but when you get into like you mentioned, like Greta Van Fleet, whatever, where you well, they're influenced by whoever, like Led Zeppelin or whatever. Now you're you're in, you're touching more on the organic thing, where it's like, well, you probably the fans probably don't want that. I'm thinking, you know, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you never know, right? And, and uh, what the fans want, they could change from one month to another, right? What's what's in, so to speak. And I, yeah. I think for, for for rock musicians and rock fans, at least we have that consistency, right? 
even mm. though the genres might be, you know, a bit different, but the rock music with the drums and the guitars and actual instruments is still there, even though some people are using <laughs> a lot of computers yeah. now, but, but still the, yeah. the, the base, the basic stuff is still there, right? Yeah. You know, and I, and I, you know, and it is, there's nothing wrong with editing things. Um, I become against it when it's, it starts to sound uh, stale and lifeless when you, when you per perfect everything. Like you don't leave the noises and the scratches in and the guitars and the bass or, or, you know, um, yeah. you know, or you, you, or you, you cut out when the, when the singer's breathing, you cut that out, you know, like, well, that's part of the charm to me, you know, like yeah. it's, it's music, it's rock and roll. So I, I think as long as people are careful with those kind of things, um, a digital recording, it can be a, a beautiful thing and a good creative tool. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of, of the recording, I was thinking when you mentioned that now with the breeding with singers, um, think about if you would listen to Skid Row's Slave to the Grind today with a new, with a mixed, mixed today compared to 91 when it was released. Sebastian Bach, his, before every sentence he was singing, the, you can hear him really fill his lungs right. with with <laughs> with air before he sang, and yeah. and that that made that record so cool. I mean, that was one of the yeah. many things that made that record so cool, in yeah. my opinion. And they played really well, and they played really tight. But it was they recorded onto tape. It was they had to play the stuff. They couldn't cut them. You can cut and splice tape, but it's very 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 time consuming. But yeah. um. But it, and another great example is David Coverdale. Even you listen to a song like Still of the Night, which is a very loud, you know, heavy hitter. Um, it, you can hear his breathing through the entire song uh, between yeah. each when he pauses and he breathes and all that stuff. Um, why not? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I like it because that makes it more more live so to speak and uh, uh yeah. me personally i enjoy that the human singing. i want to i want to hear the humans i want to hear the humanity in it. i don't want to I, I i personally don't like to take that out right yeah and like you mentioned david cobdales because his voice is all his kind of mumbling from time to time and like baby 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 whatever he's singing it's like that makes his music so powerful and enjoyable in my opinion so that's it, really interesting yeah I, agree. I wanted to ask you about the uh, a separate uh, back to your soul sign so i know i mean you're the main songwriter it's your band so what what is the process really i mean do you just sit down and say okay now today i have eight hours dedicated to soul sign to write music or is it just coming when, when you're feeling inspired Anything you can share? It always comes at the wrong moment when I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> when I'm at a loud place or loud, I shouldn't say necessarily restaurant because it's maybe too loud, but, or, or, but, but it comes in moments when I'm super, super tired. I'm just falling, falling asleep. An idea comes and I have to get up and grab my phone. And I usually record ideas onto my phone. I usually sing them into the phone. It could be a bass line. I'll, I'll hum that into the phone, or it could be a, a vocal line or anything. And then th that turns into songs. And, and, and sometimes I'll, I'll be, I'll have my bass and I'll just play the whole thing without, I'll write it as I'm playing it. Okay. And there it is. I just know where to go. I can just, you know, and, and, and that's it. So, um, so it, each, each song comes, you know, differently. Um, and a few of the tracks from our new record, me and the drummer got together and, and we're jamming and coming up with stuff just by, you know, jamming together. And then we, we'd recorded on the phone. And then we, you know, we, I developed the songs, so we developed them more together than at the next time we got together. And then they kind of turned into songs that way. So, <laughs> okay. Some of them were like the most simple, simple things that were like, like almost dumb simple, but <laughs> a, 
most of the great songs are like that super 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 simple and then it leaves it wide open to do anything with the melody or the guitar or or, or you know you can expand the bass after that point or whatever but yeah. it's just interesting how that works it's you know you start doing all these complicated things you, you kind of automatically you're restricted because you can only do so much with these busy riffs and stuff like that you know? yeah, yeah when it's like bump 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 like something real simple 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 one note out of the bass or whatever simple drum beat it just opens up all sorts of ideas yeah, yeah. that's and so it, cool I, and, yeah the funny thing with this record i haven't listened to a lot of the songs for, for a while and i was on a flight from new jersey to las vegas uh and um I, I had a I had a bourbon, I had a coffee, and then I had <laughs> two napkins and a, and a and a pen. And I wrote lyrics for six of the songs in two hours, and it was just like a fountain. They just and when wow. I took the lyrics, I took the lyrics and paired them with the songs. I my conscious mind didn't even remember half the parts of the song. <laughs> Everything fit perfectly. It was almost like my subconscious mind already had it figured out. That's uh, very bizarre. The creative part of your brain was just flowing. <laughs> it was just flowing. It was just like you turn on the, fa the, the faucet and it just went shh. You know? Yeah. And, and speaking <laughs> of the lyrics, have you written the lyri lyrics for all the songs for the album? Uh, yes. I wrote all of them except for, uh, let me think here. Uh, yes. Uh, all of them except for um, one song where um me and mark uh, both wrote the lyrics for that one. okay yeah uh, no I, the music I, I can't is mostly me some of it is is mike and then then there's some outside writers from the, there's a couple of songs that were pulled off the shelf that are very 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 old and they got some some people that probably don't even remember that they wrote these songs with me <laughs> that's okay. how old they are <laughs> No, oh, I like that. And I'm, I'm, I know I heard one demo a few years back uh, with vocals from, from Mark. And uh, uh, I'm not sure it's going to be on the album, but that was a really good song. And that just kind of indicates what kind of quality of your songwriting and what we can expect from this album as well. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, it, 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 the, each song is different, even stylistically a little bit, and then, and but they, it, it's, I like that about it. You know, it's it's uh, got a good variety of stuff. Yeah, and um, yeah, and speaking of the of the song "Clean Soil," so you have a snippet on YouTube already, a really good video. I think it's a minute and a half or something at like that, right? Something like and that. And people should check that out, and also obviously by the. Uh, the, the full song from iTunes and um, pledge on, pledge the album, right? I mean, be part Absolutely. of it, be part of the, uh, you, you can even pay to be executive producer, which is a really cool thing. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and this idea you come up with here is, is uh, maybe not unique, but it's a really cool thing. I like that idea, especially when you're independent and, yeah. Maybe you want a bigger cut of, of of the hard work you put in, and this is kind of the only way to do it nowadays. Because otherwise, you yeah. get screwed, right? So, yeah. And I wanted to make sure to, too that you get something for what you're paying. If you if you pay 150, you get 150 dollars worth of of uh, stuff of yeah. you know, music and, and merch, and you know. So people go like, "Oh, I paid 150, but I'm actually I'm getting." The vinyl, the C signed CD. I'm getting a T-shirt. I'm getting this. I'm getting that, and uh, that, that I I kind of like like that idea when I when, you know and I try to stick to that. So it's not like oh here's you know this is a thousand bucks, but I'm not getting much for it. That's kind of like you know what I mean. Unless somebody wants to pledge that just to, to support, it's different. But um, so that right, that right. I kinda like like that idea, and you know. Uh, we'll see what happens with it, but it's, you know, how it is these days, people, people want everything for free. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, well, I mean, today people have a hard time. I mean, yeah, 
I, I don't blame people who, who can't put in money to go to a concert, to can't, they can't go, you know, buying CDs and I, I don't blame anyone. And, uh, it's just, I'm happy for the people who can do that, who have the, the means to do that. They actually do it. And I, I respect that very much. Yeah, no, it's absolutely. Uh, yeah. it, we'll, we'll see that, you know, just got to plow through their hard times and, you know, on the other side, and you know, it's like when, when, when the times are low and the times are slow, keep working and then when 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 times are better again then you're ready you know that's the kind of thing so, right uh, that's what i think any band or artist should do just, just keep, keep uh, writing music and and uh you know somehow yeah, things will change you know we'll see, we'll see what happens yeah and, and uh, i mean like i as a musician right it's not like you, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to come up with ideas. I'm not going to write songs. I'm not going <laughs> to have, have a, a bourbon and a coffee and, and start writing lyrics. It's just, you, you, you can't help yourself. It's just part of, you, part of you and part of your, yeah, you know, your being, right? Well, th that's a good point. And I think whether there's money in it or not, or you do it for fun as a hobby or you're a professional, the key... Um, the foundation is having fun and enjoying it, you know? Yeah. And if you don't have that, there's, you really don't have anything and you, you're not going to have a good product. So I think finding that, and that's been with me too, in the last few years, I've had to come back to the point where I'm like, I want to be that kid again. It's going to be tough to be, but you know, whether it's a, about a new instrument or whether it's a good song or I go to rehearsal with a band, I want to, I want to be like that kid. I want to have fun doing it, not just be like the militant band leader that goes, "No, oh, but I'm there." You know, you know. I've been that guy, and it's good. It's it, it's very productive a lot of times. But sometimes you have to take a step back and just just be that kid. Speaking of yeah. instruments, so so uh, Ivan has just built me this custom uh, bass. Uh, took him a year, but. Um, Oh, so wow, when I got it, beautiful, I, I've never been so happy getting an instrument before, and uh, so proud and and like a kid, really. You know, <laughs> every every detail on it was controlled and decided by me. And you know, obviously, like I spoke with them, and they gave me uh, Tyler at the Ivan is just working with me on this, and it's given me a lot of advice well we can't do this but maybe we, we can do this instead and i'm like okay cool and it's that's really cool it's got the the uh, uh billy sheen relentless demarzio pickups which i'm you know, i used to have demarzios on all my bases before and then I, and i got to a point where i'm like you know what i'm gonna sit down and a b my demarzio pickups with <laughs> other pickups that i recently and it's just no comparison it's just there's, oh, wow. They're monstrous, monstrous pickups, and uh, so are they active I, or passive? But, yeah, yeah, it, 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 passive. So are all my passive? four strings are passive, like the five strings and, and fretless bass. I like to have a an EQ and a preamp to kind of push the mid range a little bit to get the tonality out better. But on a four string, I don't like the preamp at all. It really, really, no, I don't like the tone of it. You. There's no bottom end in the in the in the thin strings at all for some reason on the active basses and um, it's just more organic this way. Okay. And uh, this this is the bass bass tone the, the passive um, bass tone that we've been listening to since we're we're kids, <laughs> the yeah, 60s, right. and 70s, and 80s um, bass lines were mostly recorded on on passive basses. So, so, yeah. But, so is this like a Bjorn England signature or it's just designed well, by you, so to speak? You'll have to ask Ivan is that if they're gonna <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I would like that, you know, one day, obviously. Um yeah. and uh, but uh like this David's bridge, right? Great, great, really cool. Uh good sounding. I, I love the gold hardware there. Oh thanks. Yeah, I, I made it all gold. So at first I was like, put a black pickup on here, and then, and then Billy Sheehan said like, well, why don't you, 
why don't you want to match it? And I'm like, well, is it going to match the tone? Because it I put the black pickup because it, it had had a lot of bass according to the schematic. And right. then I put this on, and it actually sounds better, and it looks cool too. So, it does also look cool. You know, and then, yeah, and and I mean it's funny because I always stuff. been, oh wow, I like that. I have those. I have to have those. In yeah. 1991, uh, all my bases have had the Chuck Oh, since 1991. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so, speaking uh, of gold hardware, I, I mean, I was, I always been a fan of chrome hardware and black hardware, but now the yeah. last couple of years, I'm like, gold is pretty, pretty goddamn cool. <laughs> yeah. For some yeah. reason, it, 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 I don't know what happened, but it was like something that. You'd see jazz guys play gold hardware. Yeah, you know it wasn't like a rock thing. It was always and and I don't know. That's a good question. Why is that? Uh, you know, I, I, no, I don't you know. know either. <laughs> I never on any other custom basis in my life that the companies I worked with built me. I never had. I can't recall having gold hardware on any of them. But yeah. now I'm thinking like, why not? You know. This is, it could I, be I your thing, it. your 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 signature, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, and speaking gold. of Ibanez basses, so you play Ibanez basses exclusively. Uh, what about amps? Amps, uh, I played EBS amps exclusively for over 20 years, um, since 2003. Um, and it's kind of like the thing where... Um, it's great, but it also sucks. Once you start playing their amps, everything else sucks. <laughs> so, so I, I just fly, I, you know, we fly up gigs from time to time, and there's no chance to get, you know, EBS on the rider or, or all this stuff. So I, I'll have to play whatever's there. And oh yeah, I, I learned to work with it. I get most of my tone from my pedals, but it's it, it's a nightmare when you you get used to something and it's uh, um, it's a really really incredible um company and the products and they make yeah. make really good pedals to play exclusively ebs pedals too so okay um, and you, you said 20 years right Tw yeah 20 coming up 21 almost okay yeah yeah and ebs is a swedish company i know so it, it's a good thing to kind of be loyal to your your motherland if you will right <laughs> yeah it was interesting because when i was i was working at a music store when i was 19 20 years old back in sweden and ebs had just started you know the a, a new company and we had a, a rig of theirs and i, I was kind of new to it and, and uh i had to make a call to them a couple of times because we blew a couple of the abs up <laughs> i had to make that hey i'll get some some bad news for you so I kind of got to know them slightly over the phone, and then I'd run in and run into them at the NAM show and stuff like that through the years, and and then they'd be like, well, "What the hell? When are you going to start playing our stuff?" I'm like, "Well, when are you going to give it to me?" You know, and, and that's kind of like the, <laughs> how the conversation started. So, yeah, I ended up actually buying the first rig from them, and then they've just been wonderful ever since. And, We've had, we've yeah. been through a lot together, and then we've, we've developed a really, really, really nice relationship, and they're, they're, they're great friends, and and uh, it's, it's it's been really cool to uh, to uh, great experience to get that close to a company and see how they work and see how they develop the products and see also learn a lot of a uh, lot of, lot about business from them from the yeah. CEO especially both and. Uh, and kind of like a mentor. Uh, <laughs> That's cool. And, and you mentioned you play EBS pedals as well. So any specific one you want to mention? Um, oh, the one I'm always using is the multi-comp, the compressor pedals. I mean, they have compressor built into the amps, but it's a it's a really good pedal. And so it's one of those things, once you start using it, when you don't use it, you miss it. You know, it's a very discreet oh, yeah. compression, but it's very like punk makes this tone really punchy and um so i used that all the time i've been using one pedal it's the billy sheehan signature overdrive pedal which, which is a very very flexible 
piece. I'll, I'll show it to you real quick. Very flexible. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, for any style um, of music uh, or ba style of bass player or tone of a bass player, because you can you can adjust the um, amount of drive, but also the level of the drive signal. And then you have the clean signal. Um, oh, cool. And then you have compression. And then you have a boost. You have a lot of different options. And you have loops. So you can loop whatever reverb or you want a chorus or whatever. Um, so you have a loop for the clean signal. And you have a loop for the dirty signal. So, oh, so wow. So you, you're processed separately. And then you bring them together, you know, and uh, uh, it, it's highly recommended. Sorry, That's cool. Little, little, yeah, little, and I'll, I'm going to put the, the link cool. to your equipment in, in, in the description, whatever is available to, for sale, so to speak, to in, right. in retail. And, and um, when it comes to those those loops and the dirty signal and the clean signal, I, I know that Bill Sheehan, he has two inputs on his bass. So is that is that why, or I mean, I'm not too technical around that piece. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's a really really great question. Um, this would be for for one signal to go through. Um, what he does, he brings two signals, one from each pickup, and then he processes, oh. he puts them in through different amps. Um, okay. This one would be going like not backwards, but if you have one signal from the bass, then then the pedal will, will the pedal will split it for you and process one keep one clean and keep one signal dirty. And then the blend basically we have two blends. You have an amount of clean and the amount of dirty. And you blend those two together and it comes out of the output here. Okay. Oh so I'm going backwards. This is in, this is out. Um huh. So it, it's uh, it's not really that complicated, um, but it has a lot of options. It has a tone control too, so you can get a lot of different tones out of this. You know, and you just want a little bit of grid. Like you, even you play a ballad, you may not want a completely a clean tone. It's great for that. You play thrash metal, you want a super dirty tone, you can get that. Mm -hmm. um, you want a you know a, an old classic rock, you know, a little bit of distortion. You can get that, so it's, it's really, really cool pedal. Uh, versatile. Use it all in the sessions and, and gigs. Yeah, that's cool. So I'm, I'm just, um, I don't want to hold you up too long here. I just have a couple more questions I want to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you and I, we can talk for hours, right? But uh, yeah. I just want to, from a from a musician perspective, I mean, you've been on so many tours with so many bands, right? Is there mm -hmm. anything? about being a rock musician that people who are not involved in the industry, they, they might, might think that's um, surprising or surprising or unexpected. Anything like that you can come, you think, can think of a, something that's being that, on tour. That yeah. I think obviously, and I don't blame them. They don't, they don't see the backside of things. They don't see how, you know, how it sucks walking into the bathroom on the bus at, at four in the morning while the bus is going 75 miles down the highway and somebody had just peed on the floor right before you, you know, oh, you know, God. stuff like that. Or, or you, <laughs> or you walk in and, and you, some dressing rooms are wow. You know, you play one night and the venue's amazing and the dressing rooms are fantastic. And you walk into the next one and it's like, what the hell is this? Like, <laughs> if, if people wouldn't even if I filmed some of them, people wouldn't even believe it. They would be like, Man, that can't be your dressing room. Oh, is that bad? Or yeah. that disgusting in some places. So <laughs> um, you know, going backstage is not that uh, uh what do you call it? Um, uh, that big of a deal. Yeah, not and I think I think that's one thing that people think about. Like they being a rock musician or being a musician or anything like that, like it's so glamorous. You have the limos, you have the, the bottle service, then the green rooms are all backstage are like 
decked out with everything you can even imagine, but it's not really that in, in real life, right? <laughs> Maybe not today, at least. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and it depends on what tour you do and which band, all that stuff. It, it varies. You know, I've done some, you know, I do a fantastic tour and I come back to LA and I jump on the, on the, on a, on an old bus with another band and I do a smaller tour with, you know, with a catering is barely existing. The dressing rooms small and cobwebs everywhere. And, um, <laughs> It's better to go from the bad tour to the good tour, but sometimes you just go like, "Hey, you know what? It's 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 work, and if the people you're traveling with are nice, that's the most important thing, really." Um, you, you're spending, like I always say, you're spending 90 minutes on stage, but you're spending 22 and a half hours together on the tour bus, you know, and then you better get along with the people, or you're you're going to be in trouble. So it's. Yeah. Uh, it is what it is, but I, I, you know, the backside, and also a lot of it is unfortunately not playing music. It's administrative, the emails, the scheduling, the social media, you know, gear. Um, that's like eighty percent of it. Music oh, is yeah. maybe twenty percent if you're lucky. So, uh, wow. yeah, and it, it, sometimes that's okay when you've played for a long time, like I have. But when you're new and you really need to get the hours in to 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 get the mileage, when you're 20 years old, it should be the other way around. It should be 80% music and 20% business. Yeah. But if I had a son who was a musician now and he was 20 years old, I'd tell him business. Yeah. yeah. If you don't get your business skills, you might as well just hang the guitar on the wall and, and you know, <laughs> play for fun. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess you have to grow thick skin, right, in, in the music yeah. business you today. Be, Otherwise, you will get you know, run over, if you will. Yeah, you have to be very tough and very aggressive, and yeah. uh, that's what I've I've noticed. That you know, people that got gigs that I should have had, it's because they were aggressive. And yeah, they were not as good as me, and probably didn't uh, look as good or whatever but yeah. <laughs> or look as no, appropriate i should say but it's yeah. who you know and who you blow and all that stuff yeah. <laughs> okay. no but that's an interesting point because for, first off you have to have the skills and then you have to have the personality and so you have good chem chemistry with people and, yeah. and and then obviously having that professionalism be pre come prepared you you can't come to a tour and uh never rehearsed and, and not know the songs, right? And I think yeah. that that is one thing that you always have done. You always been prepared for every single gig you got, right? And, yeah, uh, I had uh, to be because uh, uh, Quiet Riot, we barely rehearsed. Ingve, it was not a lot of rehearsal. I mean, we rehearsed some of the stuff, it was newer stuff, but it was some of the stuff, if you if you didn't do your homework, you didn't know the songs, there's, not a, there's no time to learn the stuff in rehearsal. That's you right. do that, yeah. So uh, it's uh, you just uh, yeah, and 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 it's a snowball thing, and one thing leads to another. Somebody sees works with you, and they go like, they see how you're professional every night, every day, and then they need a bass player for another band. I think we lost Bjorn there. So Bjorn, he lost his internet connection, so we had to cut the interview short ish he wanted us to emphasize how appreciative he is if you support the campaign the kickstarter campaign link in the description check it out